from Los Angeles. Bill, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. So talk with me about how these protests are different from the ones that that, you know, are more localized, that we have seen recur over the past two decades. So these are now big and national, but I'm curious if they, if these current ones pose a genuine threat to the Chinese government. These protests, the fact that they're so widespread, spontaneous, and have all resulted from this, this absolute uh, discontent about the COVID policies is very different than what we've seen before. And I think one thing that spurred it is the fact that the Chinese population in watching the World Cup saw that the rest of the world was open and the authorities are still telling us how terrible COVID is. And whereas everyone else in the world is enjoying the, the World Cup games. So I think that has a shot in the arm to waken the Chinese population about the world is very different than the way the Chinese Communist Party has told us it is. In particular, Xi Jinping may have gone overboard in closing us down. And that's really the source of a lot of this protest is the, the lying that they're catching Xi Jinping telling. OK, so so what is the answer here? Does she have an answer here? His zero COVID rule, yeah. it's failed to control the virus, you know, nearly three years into the pandemic. As you say, the rest of the world moves on. Does he have a response other than suppression? Actually, we're going to expect to see Xi Jinping come up with even more suppression because the one thing that he cannot tolerate uh, and the lesson learned from the fall of the Soviet Union is that you cannot let domestic protests get out of hand. Domestic security was the highest priority put on the agenda from the very minute Xi Jinping arrived on the scene. Look at how he handled Hong Kong. Even there, a more localized protest was completely clamped down the minute it started to, to be persistent and get out of hand. So I would expect that to see a huge crackdown uh, put in place by Xi Jinping. Now, he may do it in a very sly sort of way and blame it on the local authorities, say, well, I was about to lift up COVID, but the overzealous local authorities have gone crazy in implementing uh, policies in a way that I didn't anticipate. So that might be his face saving way of backing out of COVID and at the same time clamping down on the protesters and saying, you guys are just misunderstanding the way the, the, the central government wants it implemented and the way it's being implemented by the local level. Could these protests mean a moment of real change in China? Do they have that kind of power? I, I, I would love to say that this may be the beginning of uh, another fall of the Soviet Union type uh, event, but it's way too soon to say that. And and China has learned its lessons from the fall of the Soviet Union. And I know that uh, the, the, the highest priority that the, the Xi Jinping and his colleagues have placed on domestic security will find some way of staying in power uh, without uh, uh, the protests getting out of hand. Now, one of the things that Western investors are going to have to do is to reassess what whether it's still worthwhile to do business in China now that operational costs have, have skyrocketed as long as, as as well as geopolitical risks. Now, you wrote that China faces increasingly severe economic and political headwinds at this point. Talk us through um, more of, of your opinion on, on what you see happening here. Well, the latest data from China has shown us that the, the big behemoth that China we thought was going to be may not be as big and as fast growing as we previously thought. The population itself is starting to shrink pretty dramatically. And, and the one way that China will be able to maintain its, uh, its, its growth that it had in the past is through productivity and investment. But Xi Jinping in his latest speeches have said innovation will be done in the, in the interest of the central government. In other words, centrally directed innovation. That's an oxymoron. You cannot direct innovation. Innovation happens by the, by the incentives of the marketplace. Uh, and every country that's in, tried to do state-controlled uh, investment incentives uh, fails in finding the best investment. So the kind of productivity growth that China needs to grow the way it did before is, is somewhat in question. And the population growth that, that gave it its, uh, its, its, its tailwinds in the past is also not there. So those are the kind of headwinds that we think will keep China in a very difficult position going forward. And again, one of the reasons why Western investors are going to have to reassess whether or not they really want to be in the China market that's not growing as fast as they thought in the past. You know, earlier this month, China announced what appeared to be significant easing of COVID restrictions. Why do you think this plan ultimately wasn't implemented? Well, China has convinced the population that the worst of every possible thing, event eventuality is to have COVID 
uh, break out in the country. Uh, and, and so he, the, the policies have demonized COVID to the point where any kind of relaxation that results in a, a, a jump in the number of cases uh, will be regarded as a personal failure for Xi Jinping. So he, again, he's going to have to figure out a way to ease back on the COVID restrictions in a way that allows more, more personal freedom, but at the same time, control the number of outbreaks. And, and that's, uh, that's an almost impossible task, given the fact that their vaccines are not as efficacious as the Western uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. All right, Bill Lee, Chief Economist at the Milken Institute. Great to have you on.